You may be seated. And if you brought your Bible, I hope you brought your Bible. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. Mark, chapter 1. And um, usually at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m., I ask who's had their coffee. Uh, I imagine by this service you had your coffee or um, some of you already had your breakfast tacos. And um, me, I, I, I normally I don't eat anything at all. I did have an empanada because someone brought me some empanadas. I had an empanada before service, but I try not to eat between services. And um, so um, we get out of here, and I'm so hungry. And I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'm kind of hungry. I think the empanada made me more made me hungrier. But anyways, um, we last week started, we're going to, uh, over the next few weeks, I don't know how long, next few weeks, couple of months, we're going to be studying the miracles of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Mark. And, um, and as we read these miracles, today we're going to read a miracle where Jesus healed um, uh, Peter's mother-in-law who had uh, fever. Um, but as we read these miracles, I, I want to encourage you to make time to read the Gospel of Mark. It won't take you that long, you know, two, three days, good reading, you're, you'll finish it. Maybe some of you, even one day, you'll finish it. And so I want to encourage you over the next few weeks, the next few months, take time, open up your Bible, look up Mark, and, and just start, put your finger down and buckle down and start reading. Um, but if you would take the time to read all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you would see that especially in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called the Synoptic Gospels. Um, you would see that there's a lot of stories that each gospel repeats. There are stories in Matthew that you will find in Mark and Luke and, um, and stories in Mark that you will find in the other gospels as well. And this is one of those stories. This is one of those stories that we're going to read and study today that is repeated in all three gospels. And, um, and the reason is that they come from different perspectives. Uh, right here on uh, where we're at is Pasadena Boulevard, and then one of the um, side streets of the church is Curtis Street. Um, I, I will tell you that if you ever have to cross Pasadena Boulevard through Curtis, be very careful. There's accidents that happen here in the corner of the church all the time. There used to be a, a, stop, a stop light. They uh, it got blown away in one of the hurricanes, and years later, they're barely putting it up again because it's very dangerous. But uh, let's say that an accident happened, and you and I were, were witnesses, and the police come, and they say, uh, Mr. Villarreal, what did you see? And I would say, like, well, there was this black car that was coming from north to south on Pasadena Boulevard, and there was this other car that was crossing, this green car was crossing from west to east on Curtis Street, crossing Pasadena Boulevard, and she had the stop sign, and she went and ran the stop sign, and the car hit her, and that's how the ha accident happened. And so they come with you, and they're like, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, what, did you see the accident? Yes, I did. And what did you see? And you're like, well, that black truck was coming like about 45, 50 miles per hour, and it's only a 35 mile here, right? And the, the person in the car that was crossing Pasadena Boulevard, they were on their cell phone. They weren't even looking, and for whatever reason, got in the way, and boom, right? Same story, different details, different points of views. And this is the way the Gospels work, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You will often see the same stories, but different details and different points of views. But today we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, verse 29. And if you want, if those of you who take notes, if you, have, if you want to go back and read this story in the other Gospels, you could look it up in Matthew 8 and Luke 4, right? So, so it's going to be, and we're going to be in Mark 1, but you will also find this story in Matthew 8 and in Luke 4. But let's read Mark chapter 1, verse 29 to verse 34. Verse 29 says, After Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, he went to Simon Peter's and Andrew's home. Simon is Peter, and so that's why you'll hear me often say Simon Peter. Verse 30 says, Now Simon's mother-in-law was, in was sick in bed with a high fever, and they told Jesus about her right away. Now, notice uh, this, this is not a trick question, all right? This is, this is a little, I just want to see if you're awake, so I'm going to throw a little softball at you, a little underhand here, all right? If Simon had a mother-in-law, that means that Simon was? All right. Simon Peter. If Peter had a mother-in-law, that means that Peter was? Okay. Some of you guys are like, is this a trick question? No, it's just, it's just like, God, he has a mother-in-law, that means he's married. Let's try it again, right? If Peter, Simon Peter had a mother-in-law, that means Simon Peter was? 
okay, I don't know. Some of y'all are still like, no, what's the catch? Like, there's no catch. I mean, it's just, he had a mother-in-law. That means he was married, right? And his mother-in-law was in bed with a high fever. And immediately they tell Jesus, they're like, Jesus, G-, uh, Peter's like, look, my mother-in-law, my M-I-L, right? You know, that's how people uh, do the initials these days, right? Verse 31. So he went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her sit up. He lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she prepared a meal for them. A lot of Bibles say that the fever left, and she immediately served them, right? She served them. And so here, it, 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 they take a little bit more liberty. They say she prepared a meal for them. So more than likely, that's how she served them. Verse 32. That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases. That means that there were people that were different sicknesses and Jesus healed many. Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases and he cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. So we saw last week, right, that the demon recognized them. And and so sometimes they were disturbing. They wouldn't let him preach or minister. So he would not let them speak. But one of the verses that we saw last week was in Hebrews. And and someone help me out. If you were here last week and you were awake or semi-awake, right, we learned, according to Hebrews, that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forevermore, right? One more time. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You guys really did not stop at Starbucks or something like that. All right. Let's try it one more time. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, there you go, and forevermore. We have a lot of people missing, so I need y'all to make up for those who didn't come, all right? So, okay. So if Jesus yesterday healed those who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, what do you think he's doing today? He is still healing many with various diseases and he is still casting out many demons. He had power and authority to do it yesterday. He has power and authority to do it today and he will have power and authority to do it tomorrow. All right, so help me out. Jesus has power and authority to heal sickness and cast out demons yesterday. He has power and authority to do it today, and he will have power and authority to do it tomorrow, mañana, right? Okay, let's go to verse 29, right? Verse 29 says, after Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's Andrew's home, okay? Now, last week, I, I touched on this, and I want to emphasize more on this is that Jesus went to the synagogue. Remember, he went, uh, last week we saw that he was teaching in the synagogue, and then he delivered the man that was possessed that was in the synagogue. So Jesus went to the synagogue, okay? Now, the synagogue for us today would be church, all right? It's like saying Jesus went to church, okay? Now, Jesus is Emmanuel. Remember in Christmas, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is God with us. Jesus is the Son of God. As the Son of God, that means He is equal to God. That means that He is God. John starts off his gospel by saying, in the beginning, speaking of Jesus, was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then he says that the Word took on flesh and dwelt among us, And it says that through this word, all things were made. And without this word, uh, nothing of what we see, nothing of what exists would have been made. So we understand that Jesus is God. He is the invisible that has become visible. He took on flesh to come amongst us. Okay, this same Jesus saw it necessary to spend time in church, to spend time in the synagogue. How much more us, right, that we are the body of Christ, we are the church. Church isn't these four walls. Church is, is us, the, the assembly, the gathering together of believers. And Jesus is the head of the church. If it was important for Jesus, it should be important for us. And let me tell you that Jesus really, really loves the church, right? Jesus really, really loves the church. And again, I'm not talking about these four walls. I was remembering last service, 
that when uh, La Iglesia del Pueblo was a lot smaller, um, there, there's this park here in Pasadena called Satsuma Park, and we used to have services there. Like my dad would say, hey, this Sunday, we're going to gather at Satsuma Park, and we would go to the park, and under the pavilion, we would set up chairs, have praise and worship, and then they would split up, you know, little sections in the park, and we would do Sunday school class, then afterwards, everybody would come and, and, and eat. And um, so that, didn't stop, it, that didn't stop us from being the church because we weren't in the building. Right? Church is, is the body, right? Church is us, each one of us, members, many members, one body. Okay? Now, Jesus really loves the church. Jesus loves the church so much, and I've taught you this in the past. Jesus loves the church so much that, first of all, he came to establish the church. Jesus loves the church so much that he died for the church. Jesus loves the church so much that at this moment, he's seated at the right-hand side of the Father, advocating, interceding for the church. And Jesus loves the church so much that one day, one day soon, Jesus is going to return. And guess who he's going to return for? Somebody help me out. The church. He's going to return for the church. So Jesus really loves the church. So if it was important for Jesus to go to church, I think it's important for us to go to church. And, and I want to share with you what happens when you start coming to church regularly. First of all, you, you strengthen your faith. Coming to church strengthens your faith, right? Coming to church strengthens your faith. You're strengthened. You're encouraged. You're uplifted. When you see other believers, when you see other people that look like you, when you see other people coming, other people that, you know, they, let me tell you, if, if we don't have the time, we could spend a whole year if everybody came up here and shared their, their problems, their issues, their struggles, whatever it is that they're going to. No one would come up here and be like, nah, I'm cool, fam, I'm good. <laughs> like, no, everybody that would come up here would be like, Pastor, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> and we would be like, start from the beginning. And then we'd all be like, <laughs> like, like man, that was a long beginning. We ain't even in the middle yet, right? Like, I mean, all of us have issues. All of us have problems. All of us are going through something in our marriage, in our family, at work, or, or in our finances, or in our health. But look around. We are here gathered together in the name of Jesus, worshiping and exalting the name of Jesus because Jesus still heals the sick, still saves the lost, and still delivers those who are oppressed. So when you come to church, like, like you strengthen your faith. And the more you come, it's like going to the gym. The more you come, the more you'll be strengthened. But uh, there's a gym in town that serves pizza. Don't go to the gym just to eat pizza. Right? Don't come to church and be like, oh, no, bring your Bible. Come early enough for praise and worship. Clap your hands. Lift up your hands. Follow along in, in, in the teaching. If you can, bring a notebook. Write some notes down. And, and then maybe tonight or tomorrow, open it back up and read these verses again. And, and think about the stuff that, that we're teaching or some of the points that I share with you um, as, as you go back and study it. Learn, learn to give. Learn, learn to participate. Uh, maybe one day you can learn to, you can uh, help out in, in serving in one way or another. But as you do this, you're going to see that, man, your belief in God your faith in God, your dependence in God is going to grow, 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 grow. All right. The second thing is that here at church, coming to church, you will learn about God's promises and truth, right? <clears throat> this is what I'm dedicated. This, this is what my life is about, right? Is that I'm here to share with you. We are here to share with you, whether it's the teaching, it's discipleship class, it's ministry class, it's red letter challenge, it's VBS, uh, what, uh, <clears throat> it's a, a dinner with the pastor, whatever it is. We are here to share with you God's promises and God's truth. Truth, God's truth, all right? Because it is God's promises and God's truth that are going to help you to keep going forward, right? I, I hope you don't leave everybody, you know, pastor said, and pastor said, pastor, no, I don't want you to be like going and quoting pastor. Well, you know, like pastor says, no, what I want you to do is leave here and say, you know, the Bible says, God says, the word says, the scripture says, that, that's what I want. I don't want you walking out of here and be like, oh yeah, well, you know, pastor said, you know, at work tomorrow, well, you know, the pastor said, like, like they're like, who the heck is your pastor, right? You know, like, they don't care. But when we talk about scripture, when we talk about the word, when we talk about Bible, man, that's, that's where the power is at. And so when, the more you come to church, the more you should be leaving here with knowledge of the Bible. And on that note, just a little caveat, I want to encourage you, super encourage you, double, triple encourage you, that when you come to La Iglesia del Pueblo or Pueblo's Church, bring your Bible because we're going to open it and study it. Last week, this uh, lady came to 10 a.m. service. 
And she told me, she's like, Pastor, I live in Magnolia, Texas. And she's like, can you recommend me a church in Magnolia, Texas? I'm like, I don't know nobody. I don't know nothing in Magnolia, Texas. And, um, but I, I shared with her, I'm like, look, when you go to church, look for a church that's just like here. We're gonna open the, they're going to open the Bible, and you're going to look at the verses, and you're going to see, and, and that's, that's, that's really important, right, that for you to learn that. The third thing, coming to church, you will not feel odd when you approach God. If you are coming to church regularly, you, this is the third point. If you're not coming to church regularly, you will not feel odd when you approach God. Uh, people don't come to church. People don't pray. People don't see God because they feel odd that they haven't been doing it. And, and, and one of the, the fails that happens is that we often do it when we need something. There was this uh, philosopher, and he says, like, um, he says, when you're thirsty, you're always facing the well, right? When you're thirsty, you're facing the well, the water well, and you're walking toward it, and you're walking toward it, and you're walking toward it, and you're thinking about it. And, but once you get to the well, and you drink from the well, and you, you satisfy your thirst, what do you do? You turn around and you give it its back, and you walk away from it. And many people approach God in the same way. You need something from God? You come to church. You need something from God, now you're praying. You need something from God, now you're talking to the hermanos. Right? You need something from God, now you're messaging the pastor. Right? But once God fulfills, once God does, once God works, once God, once God provides, then all of a sudden, like, you know, we, we just kind of go on with our own life. No, come to church, keep coming to church. Right? If you started coming to church because there's something going on in your life that needs to be fixed, hey, first of all, I tell you, Welcome. Don't be, don't be offended by what I'm saying. I'm telling you, welcome. I'm just encouraging you that after God meets, after God provides, after God does, after God helps, after God lifts you up, after God heals, after God saves, keep coming. Keep seeking. Keep worshiping. Keep praising. Keep praying. Keep studying the scriptures because that's where the real power is at. Right? But, you know, we don't come in. And this, this is a real issue. There are people that were raised in church as little kids. They took them to church. And, and somewhere along the line, they chose a wrong path. And then uh, the, God is like calling them. God is calling them. But they feel awkward coming back. There's a, there's a, a, a video uh, right now that, that's out there of, of this... Um, of some, this rapper, he's one of those guys, he's all tatted on his face, he's a Latino rapper. And um, he talks about in this interview that as a little boy, they used to take him to church. And, and, and the interviewer tells him, do you remember any of the songs? And he's like, yeah. And he even sings like, like he's like, I don't remember it too well. And he even sings a, 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 a portion of, of a song that we used to sing here, here at church. And she tells him, like, would you ever go back? And he's like, I want to go back. But I'm sure that there's a big part of him that just feels embarrassed or ashamed. He feels like he's going to be criticized to go back. You know what? Come back. Right? Come back. Here at Pueblo's Church, we're not here to criticize you. Here at Pueblo's Church, we're not here to, to judge you. Here at Pueblo's Church, we're not here to talk about you. But one thing we are here to do is to lift up the truth is to lift up the truth that in Jesus Christ, there's still salvation. In Jesus Christ, there is still healing. In Jesus Christ, there is still power. There is only one way, one truth, one life. And there's only one way to get to the Father, and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. You will hear that. You will hear it over and over. And you will hear that you have to repent from your sins. And you will hear that you've got to leave the things of the world behind and decide to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. But you're welcome to come back home. Come back home. And you know what? When you come back home, you won't feel so weird, so odd, so awkward coming to church. Right? Now, notice this verse once again, verse 29. It says, after Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon Peter's and Andrew's home. They went to Simon Peter and Andrew's home. Right? This is, this is a... a, a this is a, a huge missing link happening in the church today in America, where Jesus, where the Holy Spirit, where God is welcome to our church, but is He welcome to your home? Like here in church, you praise, you worship. Here in church, you open up the Bible. Here in church, you think and, and you give and you offer. And, but what happens tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday in your home? Is Jesus still being worshipped in your home? Is Jesus still being sought in your home? Is, 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 is there praise and worship? Is there offering being given to Jesus in your home? 
Because Jesus isn't just here at church, and he isn't just waiting for you here at church. He wants to accompany you when you leave here from church. Well, I, I grew up in, a, in another era, and, and the days that I grew up in, we used to come to church in the morning, 10 a.m., and then we would come back to church at night, 7 p.m. And the vast majority of the hermanos would come back at night. Like, I would say like 80% of the people would come, come back at night to serve. That was like a common thing. And, and growing up, I remember after church, nine times out of 10, either I went to one of my friend's houses or they came to my house. There was a, uh, there, there, there was a welcome. Let me say you that 10 times out of 10, Jesus wants to go with you back home. Right? Jesus wants to go to your house. Jesus wants to go and hang out with you under your roof. Right? Jesus wants to hang out with you the rest of the time that we're not in church. Right? So uh, uh, notice that they opened their home to Jesus. And if you read the Gospels, you will find out that many of the miracles of Jesus occurred, many events occurred in people's houses. Do you all remember that story? Who here went to Sunday school as a kid? Anybody here go to Sunday school as a kid? All right, we're going we're to do a test right here. Do y'all remember that story of where um, these four friends, they have a friend who's paralyzed and they can't get him to Jesus uh, because there was too many people, the door was too full. So they go on the roof and they tear the roof up, right? And then they lower their friend at the feet of Jesus. Where did that happen? Somebody, can, somebody who went to Sunday school as a kid, where did that happen, hermana? Somebody's house. They didn't tear the roof of the temple. They didn't tear the roof of the synagogue. They tore the roof of somebody's house. Right? All right, I'm going I'm to throw another one. This, this one might be a little bit harder. Right? Remember the story of where um, this, this, this girl brings like perfume, pours it on the feet of Jesus, and with her hair, she's like cleaning the feet of Jesus. And then Judas, you know, Judas the sellout, he's like, oh, he goes, that perfume could have been sold and given to the poor, but it's really because he wanted to pocket some of the money, right? And Jesus says, leave her alone. He goes, um, what they say? He goes, the poor you will always have the poor with you. Right? Anybody remember that story? Anybody remember where that happened? Where did that happen? In somebody's house. Right? Somebody's house. One of my favorite stories of Jesus is where he goes into someone's house after, after ministering, goes into someone's house, and these blind guys, I don't know how, but these blind guys find where Jesus is at, and they say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And he, and he heals them. And, and you will find this over and over and over and over. So, so here, here's, here's a couple of questions for you. One, is your home open to Jesus? Right. Now, most of us will be like, oh, amen, hallelujah, brother. Okay, my second question, is your home open to the followers of Jesus? Because Simon and Andrew opened their home not only to Jesus, but to James and John. Now, some of you would be like, you know, first time you are like, amen. Second time you are like, amen. First question, is your home open to Jesus? Amen. Is your home open to the followers of Jesus? Most of us are like, amen. Looking around like, who else? Well, I'm going to take it a step further. All right, a step further. Let's go ver uh, to verse uh, 34, I think. 33. Give me verse 33. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. Is your home open to people who are seeking Jesus? Is your home open to your one? Right? We often talk about having a one in our lives, and a one in our life is someone that is not a follower of Jesus, that you're praying for them, you're inviting them to church, you're serving them, you, you want them to come to know God through his son, Jesus. That, that's a one in our life. And, and let me tell you, I really believe in bringing our ones to church because for the vast majority of us, everybody that's here that's serving the Lord, the vast majority of you, you really became serious in your faith whenever you started coming to church. So I, I believe in coming to church and I really taught all, just spent about 15 minutes teaching on the church. But for the vast majority of your ones, the real opportunity to speak to them about Jesus is not going to be when you bring them to church. It's going to be when you invite them to your house for unos fajitas. 
is going to be when you sit at your table with them with some coffee and some maranitos, right? It's, it's going to be when, you know, you invite them to the house for, for some burgers, for some hot dogs, you know, and, and, and then y'all sit down and they're telling you about their issues in their marriage and they're telling you about their issues with their kids and they're telling you about their issues with their finances and what have you. And you're listening and you're listening and you're listening and you're listening and then you share with them how God has been working in your life since you started coming to church. How God has been working in your life since you started seeking Him. You share with them the transformation that's happening in your mind, the change that's happening in your mind, the transformation and the change that's happening in your heart. You share with them the peace that you have since you started putting your faith in Jesus and believing more and more in Jesus. You share with them the miracles that, that God is doing in your life. You share with them your testimony because you are the expert in your testimony. But we need to open up our homes. We need to open up our homes. And I think that if all of us here at Pueblo's Church, if we would learn to open up our homes to Jesus, first of all, to fellow believers that in our house, that there would be praise and worship going on in our homes. And then that we would open it to people that, that are, are curious, that they want to learn about Jesus. We, we, we will see a revival, right? We will see wildfire happen here uh, um, with us here at church. Can anybody in agreement with that? Anybody say amen for that? Let's go to verse 30. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever, and they told Jesus about her right away. Now, I like this because it speaks of Simon's mother-in-law, and especially in, you know, here in the raza and the community, you know, we always joke around about La Suegra, and we're always making jokes about La Suegra. I, I said this at 8 a.m., I said this at 10 a.m., and I'll say it right now. Man, I got lucky, I got blessed, I have a wonderful suegra, I love my suegra. I'm not saying it because my wife is here looking at me with daggers in her eyes, you know, like, and I, I'm not saying it because at 10 a.m. My, my, uh, my suegra was there, but no, no, I, I'm really blessed with a great suegra. But, um, you know, oftentimes in, in sort of the joke of things, right, is, is we kind of put the suegra to the side, right? Like, like she's over there. Yet we see here that they told Jesus about her and then immediately Jesus came to her, right? And I, 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 I like this because it, it shows us that there is no one who is insignificant for Jesus, right? There is no one who's too small for Jesus. We don't even know her name. Yet here we are 2,000 years later talking about her, being like, wow, what a privilege that she was able to serve Jesus and the disciples. She, she cooked for them. She gave them to eat, right? She, she wasn't the one holding the microphone. She wasn't the one playing the guitar or, 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 or the instrument, but she was, she was so important that Jesus took time to go into the room where she was at sick. And she was so important that Jesus took the time to touch her and to pray for her and to lift her up. That's how important she was. And let me tell you, I don't know what, what lies the enemy has been putting in your heart. I don't know what lies the enemy has been putting in your mind. I don't know how the enemy has been trying to belittle you. But I want you to know that the same compassion and the same love that Jesus had for Peter's mother-in-law, he also has for you. God loves you. God, God loves you. God loves you. He, he is so excited that you're here. God loves you. And I say that with full confidence. Because when it came time to save us, when it came time to rescue us, God didn't send a prophet. God didn't send an angel. No, he sent his only begotten son. When it came time to, to pay the ransom to save us, he didn't pay with Bitcoin. He didn't pay with silver. He didn't pay with gold. He didn't pay with diamonds. He didn't pay with, with Benjamins. No, he paid with the precious blood of his very own son. That's how much God loves you. God loves you that much. And let me tell you, let me tell you that every father, every good father, and uh, Father's Day we spoke about the patriarch and the importance of having patriarchs in the home, a father who's a boss, right? A father who's a el jefe, a chief. Every good patriarch, right? And we talk about the importance of having fathers who were God-fearing, who came to church and who were in the scriptures and were in prayer. Every father like that, believe me, is always happy to see their children come home is always excited about their children coming home. Always has the door open so their children can come home. And your heavenly father is excited that you are home. Your heavenly father is excited 
that you are in his house of prayer this afternoon. Your heavenly father is excited that you are seeking him and that you're here today, right? So don't believe the lies of the enemy. You are important. You are loved. You, you are cherished by God, right? But notice that they came to Jesus right away, right? They told Jesus about her right away. They told Jesus about her right away. Today, you can tell Jesus about her right away. Today, you can tell Jesus about your mother-in-law. You can tell Jesus about your, your wife. You can tell Jesus about your mother. Today, you can tell Jesus about your sister. Today, you can tell Jesus about your coworker. Today, you can tell Jesus about him. You can tell Jesus about your father. You can tell Jesus about your father-in-law. You can tell Jesus about your brother or your son-in-law or your cousin. You can tell Jesus about your friend or about your neighbor or about your coworker. We call that prayer. We call that prayer. And it's important that we would learn to be in prayer, that we would learn to be in church, and that we would also learn to be in prayer. And, and I was thinking about that. I'm like, why, why is it that some people just don't pray? And, and one of the reasons, biggest reasons that a lot of people don't pray is because you only pray, you only seek God, you only come to church when you need something. You only pray, you only come to church, you only seek God when you need something. And believe me, over time, you make yourself feel awkward. I was uh, remembering that I had this uh, childhood friend, we were friends since, since we were little kids growing up here in church, elementary age, middle school age, high school, we went to the same high school together, right around the same crowd. But after high school, we, we really didn't have a lot of uh, communication and, and randomly, just randomly, he would call and I'd be like, hey, what's up? And he would say like, hey, how's your mom? Because he knew my mom since he was a little kid. And oh, she's doing good. How's your dad? He knew my dad since he was a little kid. How's your sister? He grew up with my sister and I. How's your brother? And every, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you take me to work? Yeah, so I'd pick him up, take him to work. Then months would go by. I wouldn't hear from him for months. All of a sudden, he would call me. I'd be like, hey, what's up? And he would say like, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing, how's your mom? How's your dad? How's your sister? How's your brother? Hey, can you do me a huge favor? Can you pick me up from work? Months would pass by. Sometimes even a year would pass by. And then randomly, he would call me and say, hey, how, how are you doing? I'm doing, how's your mom? How's your dad? And I'm just like. And you know, like over time, you could hear in his voice that he himself felt awkward. That, that he, he would sometimes just be like, hey, how are you doing, man? Like, how's your mom? Like, how's your dad? I'm sure there was a, because he grew up with us, there was a genuine interest. But at the same time, he knew it was messed up that he was only calling when he needed something. And many times we don't want to pray for that very reason. Many times we don't want to come to church for that reason. Many times we don't want to open our Bible because we're only calling, we're only praying, we're only coming, we're only searching, we're only seeking when we need something. And let me tell you, I'm not trying to be offensive to anyone, but if you find yourself in that situation right now, you came to church because you need something, because there's something going on in your family, there's something going on in your marriage, there's something going on in your finances, there's something going on with your health, uh, you're, feel welcome, feel welcome. I'm just encouraging you that don't stop. Keep coming, keep praying, keep worshiping, keep seeking. Don't stop. Don't be like one of those people that only seek God when you really, 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 really need him. God, God's not McDonald's. He's not Whataburger, guys. He's not Whataburger. He's not the drive through at Whataburger. Then you pull up, you put your order, you, you give your offering, you get your burger, you leave until the next time you want Whataburger. God's not the drive through at Whataburger. No, he wants a relationship with you. Right? He wants you to seek him the way he has sought you. Right? And the second reason is that people feel awkward or weird when they come to prayer or they're coming to church is because you didn't come when things were good. Right? Didn't come when things were good. It, it, you know, you, you got a new job, you got a big bonus. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't call the primo and invite him for, for fajitas, but now, now you need a help. Now you need, now you need a, uh, him to loan you the truck. Now you need him to give you a ride. Now you need the primo to, to you know, X, Y, Z, get you out of a jam. And, uh, hey, primo, how you doing, primo? You're all awkward. And many times that's how we are with God. Don't just come and seek God. Don't just come and praise and worship God in the bad times. Come in the good times. 
Don't just come and see God and praise God and worship God when, when you're in a jam. Come, come when you're not in a jam. Don't just come in the middle of the storm. Come when the storm passes and you're in the middle of peace. Right? Don't just seek God when, when, when um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're down. Seek Him when you're standing. Don't just seek them when you're up on, you know, uh, when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death. Seek them when you're up on the mountain, right? when you're in victory. And, and you will see that if, 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 if this is what your life is about, then it's never awkward for you to come and seek God. You know? it's, it will never be awkward. It will never feel weird. It will never feel uncomfortable for you to come and seek God if you are continually seeking God. That's why the Bible says, pray without ceasing, all right? Pray without ceasing. Now, let's move on, because I, I want us to do something really important this, this afternoon. Let's read verse 31. Verse 31 says, so he went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her sit up. In other words, he lifted her up. Everybody say that. Say, he lifted her up. Yeah. That's what it means. He uh, took her by the hand and helped her sit up. It means that he lifted her up. Everybody say that. He Lifted it up. Okay. Then the fever left her, and she prepared a meal for them. We don't have time, but if we were to go to Matthew chapter 8, verse 15, and read this, it would say that Jesus touched her. Obviously, he took her by the hand. That means that he touched her. But, but Matthew uses the word touched. Right? Touch. And there's something powerful when you pray for someone and you can touch them. The Bible speaks of the laying, on, laying of hands, right? It's something powerful when you can put your hands over someone and pray for it. Oftentimes after service, I pray for people that they're in another country. And, you know, and so people come, can you pray for my sister? She's in Mexico. Can you pray for my mom? She's in Guatemala. And, um, and, and I believe that the same God that is present here is present over there. And as we're praying, it's instantly happening over there as well. I totally believe that by faith. But there is also something else with, when you can put your hands on someone, when you can anoint someone with oil and put your hands over them and pray for them. Nayeli and I, we, uh, when we pray before we eat, we, we hold hands with our daughters and, and we pray and, and they're getting used to that. When we pray, you know, there's a touch. And we don't only pray for our food, but we pray for our, we take that moment to pray for our families, uh, for, for our friends. And so th there, there's that touch that happens. As I was a kid, before I would leave to school, it was a common thing for my mom to put her hand over my head and remind me, you have the mind of Christ, or to pray a blessing over me. It's common for my dad uh, sometimes to come and put his hand on my shoulder or on my head and, and pray for me. And so uh, don't, don't, don't neglect, don't underestimate the power of touching someone while praying. Touch shows affection, it shows acceptance, and it shows I'm here, right? Touch shows affection, shows acceptance, and shows I'm here. I, I will tell you oftentimes, you know, I pray for sisters here at the church, and, um, and, and you know, and sometimes like, well, do, do, you know, do I touch, do I not, you know? And sometimes I'll just put like my, my, my finger on, on, on their elbow, Right, and, and, and I'll pray for them in, in that way, to be respectful um, of them. But there's something very powerful when we touch and pray. Okay, now in the Gospel of Mark, we saw that he took her by the hand, and, and not necessarily in this version, but in, in New King James Version, it says that he lifted her up, right? Lifted up. Let me tell you that God is all about lifting people up. Not one Amen. Just because I didn't have Starbucks this morning, don't take it out on me. <laughs> Let's try it again. God is all about lifting people up. Okay? And the word for lifted, which is actually used in, in, in the original uh, uh, version of this, in the original Greek, I'm sorry, is used over 135 times in the New Testament. And it's the word that's used for when they talk about Jesus was raised up from the dead. God raised Jesus up from the dead. It's the same word that, that's used for that. Let me tell you that God is still raising people up. God is still raising people up. You came in tired, God is here to raise you up. I, 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 I consider myself a, a really good father. I do my best to be a, a great father. And sometimes my daughters are playing in Rebecca and Raquel, you know, four and three, they're at that age where... Uh, they, they can run, they can walk, they can run, they can hop and skip, but they're still learning to run and hop and skip and those type of things. And so sometimes they're playing and they'll do something or they don't notice there's a chair and they'll 
stumble and they'll fall. And my first instinct, without even thinking about it, is to just pick them up. Right? I'll pick them up, I'll dust them off, make sure they're okay, and I'll tell them, go do it again. It's okay, go do it again. Right? Um, it doesn't really happen with uh, baby Ruth because she has no interest in walking. She's like, no, daddy, you carry me, right? You know, but, but you know, when they fall, that's the first instinct of a good father is to raise them up, to lift them up, to pick them up. It is the same with us, with our heavenly father. When we fall, our heavenly father moves and lifts us up. When we fall, our heavenly father moves and picks us up. He still picks up, lifts up, raises up the tired, the downhearted, right? the one that came in fatigue. He still lifts up the lost. He still lifts up the sick. God is all about lifting you up. And you leave here, you know, the word encourage, that's what encourage is, right? That you leave here with your spirits lifted up. And so we see that Jesus goes and lifts this woman up. And then the third thing I want to share with you is that in the gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 4, verse 39, it says that Jesus rebuked, he rebuked the fever. He commanded the fever. And, and the word rebuke means to condemn, to sentence, to go against. He condemned the fever. He sentenced the fever. He came against that fever. Jesus. And you today, you have power and authority in the name of Jesus to rebuke, to condemn, to sentence, to go against. Right? When we study the Gospels, we see that Jesus rebuked winds. We see that Jesus rebuked demons. We see that Jesus rebuked people. And here we see that Jesus rebuked a sickness. Speak against that sickness. Rebuke that fever. Rebuke that flu. Speak against. Rebuke that cancer. Rebuke that tumor. Rebuke those, those uh, 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 cancerous cells. Rebuke that high blood pressure. Rebuke that sugar in the blood. Rebuke it in Jesus' name. Speak against it. Speak against it. In Jesus' name, you have power to bind and power to loosen. Right? In Jesus, you have power to bind and power to loosen. Use it. Practice your faith. Pray in that way. Man, I sound crazy. Be crazy for Jesus. My, my family is going to laugh at me. My friends at work, they're going to laugh at me. Let them laugh. We're dealing with matters that they don't understand. Man, the, well, my friends, they go to another church and they don't believe in this. Well, let them believe what they want to believe. We're believing in Scripture. Yeah. We're believing in what Jesus says. All right? And we are followers of Jesus. That means we follow what Jesus did. We are imitators of Christ. And if Christ rebuked, we too ought to be rebuking. There's a lot of people in churches today that they don't rebuke nothing. They don't rebuke nothing at all. How are you not going to rebuke anything? As a follower of Jesus, an imitator of Christ who was rebuking, rebuking winds, rebuking people, rebuking demons, rebuking sickness. How are you not going to rebuke anything? That's why, as I get ready to finish, before, we, before I preach and I pray, you may wonder, why does pastor always pray the same prayer? All the time? I'm teaching you to pray. I'm teaching you to pray. And, and one of the things that you learn as you hear what I'm teaching you to pray is that without fear, with the authority given to you in the name of Jesus, bind and rebuke those evil spirits. Bind and rebuke, as we see here in Jesus, this sickness. Right? Now I'm gonna ask you, close your Bibles, and we're gonna do something different today in, in, the last, in the few minutes that we're, are left for this service. Let's stand up. I'm gonna ask everyone to stand up. We're going, to, we're going to take a couple of minutes to pray. Touched, lifted, and rebuked. Touched, lifted, and rebuked. If you are with family, you have family near you, I'm, I'm going to ask you to um, hold hands with your family members, or you, you can hug them, or, or, you, or you can put your uh, you know, hand on their shoulder, whatever. If you're by yourself, I'm going to ask you to put your hands over yourself, all right? Put, put your hands over yourself. Let's start off praying by, by simply thanking God that he's here with us. Let's, let's start praying. Say, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're here with us. 
We thank you that you are present in this moment with us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being amongst us, being over us, and being in us. We thank you, Father, for the privilege that today we came to church and we are here to praise and to worship you. Father, we put our families in your hands. Begin to pray for their salvation or for your own salvation. Father, we put our family and our friends in your hands. That you would save them. Every house that's represented here at Pueblo's Church and every member of every house that's represented here, we pray that you would save them, Father. I pray, Father, for salvation, for new life, for abundant life, for eternal life in the lives of my family, in the lives of my friends, in the lives of my ones, in the lives of every person that's represented here at Pueblo's Church. Father, we pray for healing in Jesus' name. By the stripes of Jesus, we confess the total healing of everyone that's present here and of their family members in Jesus' name. When Jesus shed his blood, it wasn't only to save us, it was, it was also to heal us. And we confess the salvation and the healing of every member in our home and every, of every member in our household. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray for healing. Father, we pray for protection. We ask that you would guard our coming in and our going out. And we ask that you would be that hedge of fire around us and that your angel would encamp around us and defend us. Father, we pray for protection, Lord, for protection of our families, for protection over every member of our households, Lord. And then finally, Father, we pray for blessing. Bless whoever's next to you. Bless them. Say, Father, bless them in Jesus' name. May the blessings fall like rain. Rain your blessings over every person that's here. Rain your blessings over their homes, over their family members. May your blessings fall on us, Father, like the rain in season and in out of season. Be magnified, be glorified. Mark used the word lifted. In this moment, we're going to lift up people in prayer. Lift up whoever's next to you in prayer. Lift up your family members. Lift up your one in prayer. Say, Father God, I lift up. I lift up my family in prayer. I lift them up, Lord, and I put them at your feet. I lift up every member of my household. I lift up my wife. I lift up Rebecca, Raquel, Ruth. I lift up the baby in prayer, Father, that you would be with them, that you would bless them, Lord. I present them before you, Lord. I lift up my parents, Lord. I lift up my in-laws, and I present them before you. I lift up my my brothers-in-laws and my sisters-in-laws and all of my nephews and my nieces and I present them before you, Lord. That you would be honored, that you would be glorified in their lives, Lord. I lift up my ones, Father. I lift up Hector. I lift up Adrian. I lift up Michael, Father. I lift up, I lift up um, Mr. Cortez, Father, in prayer and, and, I, and I put them before you, Lord, that your name would be honored and glorified, Lord. I lift them up in a, uh, by name, and I lift them up in, through this prayer and I lay them at your feet as precious offerings, as precious sacrifices before you. Be honored, be glorified in their lives, Lord. I lift up every, every member of Pueblo's church and I lift up every member of their house, every member. We lift up the kids that right now are in the nursery or that are in class or that are in small groups. We lift them up, Lord. We lift up the volunteers of this church that make the services possible from parking lots to, to the hallways, to the ushers, to the musicians, um, to audio and video, to those that are in classes, to those that come to clean, to those that come to serve in special events. We lift them up in prayer, Father, and we thank you, Lord, uh, for, for the sacrifice they do, they make. Of, of serving your people and serving you by loving and serving your people. And then Luke says that Jesus rebuked the fever. And in this moment, I want you to, without fear, begin to rebuke, rebuke spirits, rebuke demons, rebuke the devil, rebuke sickness, rebuke whatever is going on. Father, we thank you for the power and the authority that you have given us in Jesus' name. We bind and rebuke every spirit of division that comes to the marriages that are represented here at Pueblo's Church. 
We bind and rebuke every spirit of disturbance that tries to bring division to the families here at Pueblo's Church. We bind and rebuke the spirit of division that tries to bring division to this church body. Father, in Jesus' name, we bind and rebuke every tumor, every cancer, every cancerous cell. In Jesus' name, we bind and rebuke them and send them to those places that are lonesome and void that you are prepared. We bind and rebuke that high blood pressure. We bind and rebuke that sugar diabetes. We bind and rebuke those illnesses and those diseases that the enemy has, has tried to use to come against your people. We bind and rebuke all attacks of the enemy in Jesus' name. No weapon forged against your people shall prosper. And every tongue that is lifted up against them, you will condemn in Jesus' name. We bind and rebuke these attacks of the enemies. We bind and rebuke the lies of the enemy, the lies that he tries to plant in our minds and in our hearts. And we believe that your name will be honored and glorified. We bind and rebuke that spirit, that mentality of, of, be, of poorness for so many people that have been held back. We bind and rebuke that, that mentality, that spirit of poverty. We bind and rebuke that spirit of poor health. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. We bind and rebuke the spirit of timidness that stops us from proclaiming Jesus and from sharing the gospel of Jesus. We bind and rebuke the spirit of fear and we receive what you have given us, the spirit of love, of power, and of a sound mind. Now let me pray for you. Father, I put Pueblo's church in your hands. I thank you that today they said present. I ask that your grace, that your favor, that your mercy, that your blessings would be over them, that they would leave here strengthened and encouraged, lifted up, saved and healed, and above all, that your name would be honored and glorified in our lives, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Amen.